In today's A-Level IB video, we're going to be looking in great detail at the structure of the cell surface membrane. So I've inserted an image here so we can just look broadly at the structure. Things you really need to be aware of is the role of the cholesterol, the glycolipids, the glycoproteins, just regular proteins, and these yellow things here, which are the phospholipids. So if we look more closely at the phospholipids, remember they form this sort of structure. So each phospholipid has a head and it has a tail. And they arrange themselves in this way with the phosphate head pointing out and the hydrocarbon tail pointing inwards. And remember this is known as the phospholipid bilayer. Why? Because it's made up of phospholipids and there is two layers of them, hence bilayer. So looking at their properties now, why do the tails point inwards? Why do the phosphate heads point outwards? Well, it's all to do with their properties in water and it's because the head is hydrophilic, which means that it is water loving. The tails are hydrophobic. If you're phobic to something, you hate it. Hydro meaning water, so they're water hating. So they effectively repel against the water to hide themselves so they just touch other tails, whereas the phosphate heads love water so they point outwards. And I'm going to write that in greater detail down here. So the hydrophilic heads of both layers point outside the cell surface membrane because they are attracted to water. The hydrophobic tails, again of both layers, point inwards as they are repelled by water. Now the phospholipid bilayer is essential because it allows lipid soluble material to move through the membrane. You often find that if lipids can move you find that water soluble things can't. So it therefore makes sense to say that water-soluble substances are unable to enter or leave the cell through the phospholipid bilayer, and that's where the role of proteins comes in. And then lastly, unrelated to what can move, just generally what the physical properties of the membrane are in terms of the phospholipid bilayer, this layer makes the membrane flexible and self-sealing. So effectively, it can heal itself. We're now moving on to consider proteins. And as you can see from the diagram, these proteins are interspersed throughout the cell surface membrane and they are embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. Now notice that some of the proteins are simply embedded in the surface of the bilayer. They don't actually cross it. So this peripheral protein would be an example here. However, some proteins extend to completely cover the membrane, such as this channel protein and integral protein over here. So we'll look at those two roles right now. I'm sure you can imagine that the channel proteins will be involved in moving things in and out of the cell, whereas peripheral proteins will have a slightly different role. So we're going to start by saying that they are found randomly throughout the cell surface membrane in two ways. Number one, Some are found in the surface of the phospholipid bilayer. They can act as receptors for hormones and provide mechanical support. Some proteins span the phospholipid bilayer 
forming protein channels which allow water soluble ions to diffuse across the membrane. There are also carrier proteins. These bind to molecules such as amino acids and glucose. Now, the carrier proteins change shape to allow these molecules to enter cells. Remember, the amino acids and glucose are required by the cell, particularly the glucose for respiration. Because they have to change shape, we know that this will require energy from ATP, so it involves active transport. We're now going to write a fairly tedious list where we summarize the sorts of functions of the proteins. So, Obviously, we've already mentioned most of these. So the first one is that they can act as receptors, e.g. for hormones. One that we haven't mentioned yet is that they can help cells stick together. They can allow the active transport of glucose and amino acids using carrier proteins. They can act as cell surface receptors to help identify cells. They can obviously provide structural support, that's always a good answer. I remember we said that there are protein channels which help move water-soluble substances. The next component of the cell membrane we're going to consider is cholesterol. So as you can see, they occur within the phospholipid bilayer. Now their real role is to add strength and notice that they are very hydrophobic, so they hate water and therefore they help prevent loss of water and by default prevent dissolved ions from leaving the cell. So we'll write a summary now. It's found embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. They add strength to the membrane. They're very hydrophobic. So they help prevent water and ions from leaving. So those are the general properties of cholesterol. We need to talk about their exact roles that you need to learn for your exam wording. So its role includes the fact that it makes the membrane less fluid at high temperatures. We've already touched on this, prevents leakage of water and mineral ions. And because they're embedded within that phospholipid bilayer, they actually give stability. They prevent the sliding motion of the phospholipids, and we call that lateral movement. So they reduce lateral movement of other molecules, including phospholipids. Now we're looking at glycolipids. As you can see, they extend out of the phospholipid bilayer now let's consider the word glycolipid. What must it contain? Well, lipid, meaning fat, and glyco is a word associated with carbohydrates. So it's effectively a carbohydrate covalently bonded with a lipid. Now notice that the carbohydrate portion extends from the phospholipid bilayer, whereas the lipid portion is found more embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. But what do they do? Well, again, like cholesterol, they help to maintain the stability of the membrane. Because they extend out of that phospholipid bilayer, they can help cells to stick to each other. And lastly, they can act as recognition sites. So to make our preliminary notes, we're going to say that it contains carbohydrates covalently bonded to a lipid. 
the carbohydrate portion extends from the phospholipid bilayer. Its roles include the fact that like cholesterol, it maintains the stability of the membrane. Helps stick cells together. And lastly, acts as recognition sites. Now finally, the glycoprotein. So they look fairly similar to the glycolipid. They extend from the phospholipid bilayer. As the name suggests, they have both a protein portion and a carbohydrate portion. Now, any of these molecules that extend beyond the phospholipid bilayer are able to act as receptors. Notice that for glycoproteins, this is largely receptors for hormones and neurotransmitters. Again, because they extend, they can help cells stick to each other to form tissues. So effectively, glycoproteins are very similar to glycolipids, but they are obviously more concerned with proteins, hence why they can spot hormones. So firstly, they contain carbohydrate bonded to protein. The roles include the fact that they can help stick cells together. Again, they can act as recognition sites. And that's specifically for hormones and neurotransmitters. So if we look back at this diagram, we can see that the cell surface membrane contains lots of different components that we've gone into in great levels of detail here. Not too much to worry about in terms of understanding, just quite content heavy. Notice that these components are free to move within the cell surface membrane, and that's actually where the name fluid mosaic model came from. Fluid, meaning free to move, mosaic, meaning made up of lots of different components. So yes, fluid mosaic model is a good description of the cell surface membrane. The figure below shows a phospholipid. The part of the phospholipid labelled A is formed from a particular molecule. Name this molecule. So remember, when we're looking at the structure of phospholipid, remember it's made up of two fatty acid tails, which we can see are here, and a glycerol molecule. So that A is glycerol. Name the type of bond between A and the fatty acid. Have a look. This is the functional group COO, which is an ester bond. Which of the fatty acids, X or Y, in the figure above is unsaturated? Explain your answer. So unsaturated means contains a carbon-carbon double bond. So it's this one, because we can see that double bond there, so it's Y. We have to explain it, because it contains a carbon-carbon double bond. Scientists investigated the percentages of different types of lipid in plasma membranes from different types of cell. The table shows some of their results. The scientists express their results as percentage of lipid in plasma membrane by mass. Explain how they would find these values. This is a weird question. It's effectively asking you to write out in words how you'd calculate percentage mass. So what you need to do, in fact, I'll write it as an equation. You do the mass of each lipid divided by total mass. Of lipids and then because it's a percentage we need to multiply by 100. Cholesterol increases the stability of plasma membranes. Cholesterol does this by making membranes less flexible. Suggests so one advantage of the different percentage of cholesterol in red blood cells compared with the cells lining the ileum. So remember the ileum forms part of the small intestine whereas if we have a look, just have a quick look, so that has 17% whereas the red blood cell has far more cholesterol. 
So we know that there's going to be increased stability, which means that the membranes are going to be less flexible in the red blood cell, which might sound strange to you. But if you think about it, that actually helps to form their shape because they are free to move within the blood, so they're not supported by other cells, whereas the cells in the ileum are far more rigid and able to just stay where they are. E. coli has no cholesterol in its cell surface membrane. Despite this, the cell maintains a constant shape. Explain why. Well, E. coli is a bacterial cell, which means it has a cell wall. And remember, from your knowledge of plant cells, this helps to support and maintain the shape. Remember, it's made up of peptide dog lichen. So let's say E. coli has a cell wall of peptidoglycan dog lichen which helps to maintain its shape. 